So friends, hi, uh, I'm Dawn Simmons, Executive Director of Stage Source. Most of you know me by now, she, her, hers. Um, also, uh, while I'm here, quick plug for Front Porch. I'm also the Artistic Director of the Front Porch Arts Collective. Um, often my partner Maurice is on these calls. He may be somewhere lurking. He's also teaching all the time. Um, as you are coming in, please, your name, pronouns, title, um, and organization you're with in the chat. Um, we've got a great lineup of folks speaking today. So uh, just a reminder, ground rules. Um, I will go through, I will introduce our speakers. They'll talk for 10, 15 minutes, however long they have stuff to say. Um, put your questions in the chat. Tanasia, our director of programs, is writing the chat and will monitor and moderate the conversation from there um, after folks speak. We'll answer questions with each individual for about five to 10 minutes or however long we have questions for, and then we'll move on to the next person. Um, today, we are talking with a lot of your incredible Boston and Massachusetts based service organizations about where we are, let's say six to seven weeks in. Um, not just what we're hearing, but what we're doing. Um, and now that we have really been sort of living in this, what is everybody working on right now? What are the things that you need to know about and the things that you can avail yourself? of uh, services, um, people to ask questions of, all that great stuff. Um, and again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat um, as Tanasia runs through. Um, if there's something that you want to say, raise your hand. We're toggling back and forth um, and we will either try to get to you um, and unmute you or run that question through the chat. So, hello, and without further ado, I would like to welcome Cara Elliott Ortega and Pascal Florestal of the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. Hey, friends. Hello. 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 Great. Good to see everybody. Um, so, we'll just talk a little bit about what we've been working on and some of the conversations that we've been um, having and providing throughout all of this. Um, I think. You know, everybody wants to know about when we're going to reopen, um, and it's hard because we don't have the, a solid answer to that yet, right? Like, we don't right. have the um, public health guidance yet on exactly how that's going to work. Um, but we also, you know, we're in the middle of this surge of cases at the moment, um, and so I know it's hard from the public health and kind of uh, crisis response of the city to start looking beyond that when we're in the middle of this surge of cases. But um, but we do know that a lot of the efforts that are in place to flatten the curve are also working. So it's kind of like we're in this in-between space of wanting to plan for the next step, knowing that that will come, but we're also just not quite there yet. Um, we did see that the mayor announced that the public health emergency would not be lifted in the city of Boston by May 4th, which was the original deadline for that. So that's now being kind of uh, extended without an end date. And we mm -hmm. think that the governor um, will speak to that sometime this week. So I think we'll have a sense of, you know, the school year in Boston closed that set, you know, added time to this whole experience for a lot of us. And then um, this May 4th date was supposed to be the next checkpoint. And we anticipate that, at least for Boston, we know that that will be extended. We anticipate that it will be extended for the state as well. Um, so that just kind of keeps us in this in between state of not really having a next step on what it looks like to reopen. Um, but that said, you know, we as the city have to be really concerned about what the Public Health Commission and, um, you know, what the public health direction is. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of conversations to be had, um, you know, with this group, um, you know, within your own organizations. And I, I would suggest just a couple of scenarios to think about and just emphasizing again that these are totally hypothetical. This is Cara's version of what I would think about, not what the city of Boston is telling you to do. Um, but I would think about what, what does it look like for you if there's no change in any of these restrictions for the rest of the summer? Uh. So if there's no lift on the, the restriction on gathering, there's still physical distancing, and all of this is in effect for the next three months. What do you do? What do you need help with given that? Are there gonna be new things that you try to do in that time? 
if you knew that that was really the amount of time that you had. And I say it that way because I think, you know, even in the mayor's office of arts and culture, there's this rush to like plug a bunch of holes and do a bunch of things right now. And we're all thinking kind of one week at a time. But if you were able to just put pause on that and say, okay, what if this was my reality for the next two or three months? Like, what would you be doing? And, and how could we help you through that? Um, the second hypothetical scenario would be we get to the fall and there is um, less of a restriction on gatherings, but still a restriction. Uh, you can't have more than 50 people. Physical distancing is still required and there's some testing available. So this is kind of a mix of factors where maybe you could know um, and test, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 people who you're working with on something, on a production or on something, and they can be in the same place. You can't have more than 50 people in, in a space. And if you do have 40 people in that space, they still need to be practicing physical distancing, six feet apart, wearing masks, all of that. Maybe temperature checks are a part of this, I don't know. Um, and so I think that those are two kind of scenarios to think about. And what's really helpful for us is to think about what, what does that mean for you, for how you need to operate, for your business model, for how you think about audiences and engagement. And then from there, how can we start thinking about some, some scenarios where we can be helpful in that? Um, and this is kind of like, again, just things to think through before we know exactly what's going to be coming from the health commission, because I know everybody's already trying to plan. Um, so that's one piece. And then in terms of conversations that are ongoing, we've been having regular calls for arts organizations Fridays at 3 p.m. Um, and that's an opportunity to get the latest public health information. We have um, Mass Creative participate in all of those. Um, Luke, who's also here from VLA, has participated in those. And it's a chance to also hear from other organizations about what's going on and how people are kind of adapting and pivoting um, and, and throughout a bunch of different disciplines and kinds of organizations. And we've also started a call for individual artists. We have one today at four. Um, that's going to be focused. I'll put the link in. Um, sorry, what's that, Pascal? I'm going to put the link in for the meeting today oh, if anybody wants to come. Um, that's going to be, I think, focused on unemployment assistance, right? Yes, that's mostly unemployment. And we'll also have Emily from Mass Creative as well at the call to talk about any advocacy and updates that the individual artists can help with or at least spread the word about. Um, we also, um, just speaking both about organizations and, and individuals, we have a survey for organizations out. Um, I apologize that there's another survey out there, but this one is numbers that are going to go straight to the mayor's office and be a part of our reporting to the mayor. So this is an important um, kind of communication point for City of Boston. And we also have a survey for individual artists and creative workers, and that's a statewide survey that we're doing in partnership with Mass Creative. Um, so we'll, we'll add those links as well. Um, and all of that is also just related to this storytelling question. I think um, one of the things, when I think about that scenario of what if nothing changes for the next few months, and I like take a breath, I think about what are we gonna do over that amount of time around mental health? Because that's one, one of the things that's been coming up in all of the surveys, the individual artist surveys, you know, it's something where there's an overlap between what we do in the creative sector and what we provide and what's going to be needed from a public health perspective. And so there's a role for us to play in that, that I don't think, um, you know, there's some one-off programs and things happening, but there's a lot of room to have more of a response and be thoughtful about that and think about how can we support that as an office and as the city. If I stop for a moment, I think, okay, this is where we're gonna be for, for two or three months. So, that's definitely another conversation that we're going to want to have around um, uh, mental health and the role of the arts in that. And also just how we communicate what our impact is. You know, the numbers are actually really helpful. They're helpful for electeds, you know, who want to see economic impact. And then we know that there's so much more to tell. And I think it's been really challenging when you're in the middle of a crisis where there, you know, people are dying and there's real physical risk um to create space for talking about things like social cohesion and um you know creating uh you know ways for people to relate to each other outside of their homes and what that means um but as we get out of this phase i think having some of those communication uh points and data points ready is going to be increasingly important because i think in people's minds coming back from this looks like being able to go to fenway park 
with a whole bunch of other people and being able to go to a show with a whole bunch of other people. And we know that that's what success is. And yet how we actually talk about the importance of those things and the importance of gathering um, is not, is not front and center yet. So I think what's about how do we tee up some of that messaging, um, which is another conversation that we need to have. Um, Pascal, what other touch points am I missing? Um, we've also had, there's two other groups we've been having uh, some communication with recently, and we've been uh, coming, bringing together the, a lot of the relief fund people around the area and the Commonwealth. Um, we'll have a follow-up meeting with them next week, Monday, just to hear what's happening with the relief funds and how things are do, uh, rolling out. And then we, there's another group that's been uh, held, uh, helmed by Harold Stewart, Marianne, and Karthik from Company One about cultural salvation. And I think a few people from this call have been to that conversation. So that's another group of people that's trying to figure out um, what this new landscape of creating art may look like in the future. Um, but those are the two that I wanted to mention. And I'm also leaving my, putting my email in the chat. So if anyone needs or isn't able to get the link for any of the surveys that Kara mentions, please feel free to email me um, and I'll be happy to share that with you. I guess the, the last thing I'll add is um, we're part of a, a couple of national conversations as well um, that are just getting, getting going where we get to hear from other cities about how they're handling things, which is really helpful. And we get to talk to other arts offices, uh, municipal arts offices, county arts offices from around the country, some national funders. Um, and so that's been, a conversation that I'm hoping to share more back about as it as it goes but one of the topics that's come up um, is what does it look like to incorporate the arts in a recovery strategy um, whether that's kind of like a new WPA program or an artist core or some other way to to think about um, hiring organizations and artists as a part of a recovery strategy um, so that's just the, at the very beginning of a conversation right now, but it's something that um, we'll definitely want to loop back with everyone about. Um, so sorry, we just bombarded. We just jumped into bombarding people with information. <laughs> no, that is exactly <laughs> what this call is for. <laughs> Surveys. Um, uh, Cara, Pascal, I'm wondering in uh, the conversations that you're having with other states, are there any um, issues or concerns that are unique to Massachusetts, things that we're dealing with that other folks aren't, or things that they're dealing with that we aren't, things that are coming down the pike that we might want to think about? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, and I can throw this into the chat, but the state of Rhode Island just put out their mm -hmm. like very high level reopening mm -hmm. phases. I mean, it's very high level. Um, and I think it's a little bit of a reality check for us in a way in that you know, the trickle of things reopening, um, you know, all of us on this call are at the end of the list. We're not even in phase three, according to Rhode Island. We're in the everything's back open and we've gotten through it. And that's when all of the restrictions are lifted. And that's when we start talking about gatherings and all of that. Um, so I think that it's, that's a little sobering. And as we've looked at um, also some of the um, kind of economic analysis about how do you get things back online in a way that makes sense? You know, it's just a fact of what we do that it requires being in, in spaces with people. And particularly like, uh, and I bring up sports in Fenway Park because I think there's actually gonna be like a lot of alliance with um, how sports comes back online. And it's not necessarily an alliance. We should be looking at what commercial venues and commercial stadiums and other spaces are going to be doing here because I think um, it will pop up in the kind of um, political consciousness in a way that us saying, well, what about what's going to happen with this theater might not. So talking about those as one thing, as one gathering economy, I think is going to be useful. Um, Awesome. We have a question in the chat, uh, Cara, uh, from Catherine Peterson. Um, any learnings from California or Washington as there are a few weeks ahead of mass in terms of restrictions? Yeah, they are, um, you know, it's Seattle is doing a lot around thinking about how to, how this question of how to bring arts into recovery spending and support. Um, 
they are not in a, in a place yet where their restrictions are really that different. Um, so we're talking to them and we're, we're learning about how they're making that happen and what they're taking into consideration. Um, they are further along, obviously, but um, I would say that, that there aren't really any huge learnings yet. But probably in the next couple of weeks, they're going to be making changes. Um, what else was I going to say about Seattle? I guess the other thing I would say about Seattle is that they, um, they've done, I think, a better job of bringing, bringing the arts into citywide campaigns around COVID in a way that I think that we could learn from. And again, that goes back to what is something that we could tackle kind of as a sector together over the next month or two months or three months. Um, they had a, a campaign where they hired artists to make kind of like uplifting signs and they printed all of them and they distributed them around the city like lawn signs. Um, they've done some different kind of ways to commission artists as a part of, as a part of a larger coordinated effort, which I think we also want to figure out here. All right. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. So Pascal, Cara, if you can stay with us, please do. I'm going to ask you guys to mute yourselves and I'm going to move on to my good friend and colleague, Catherine Peterson of Arts Boston. Hi, Hi Catherine. Go. Hello. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, and Pascal and, and Cara, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the laying out of the different scenarios. Um, as, as hard as it is to hear and to think and to speak those scenarios, um, it certainly helps, helps us um, think about our own organizations and think about um, what we can do as a community. And I'd love to share um, three things with you that we're thinking about and working on at Arts Boston about engaging audiences, understanding audiences, and activating audiences. And um, starting with uh, an observation that um, the, I think the Boston um, arts community has really done an incredible job um, thinking about what each organization has to offer and the relationship it has with its audiences and its patrons and really um, providing uh, uh, ways to engage on an ongoing basis. Um, people have been really creative and thoughtful and um, we're seeing a lot of really good response from that. And so what we are doing is to think about how can we build on that? How can we put a spotlight on that? And that centers around really um, being able to give a little bit of extra uh, visibility for uh, those online um, offerings. Um, and so we've turned our Arts Boston calendar into a showcase for online offerings um, from Greater Boston Arts and Cultural Organizations and specifically focused on um, what is homegrown here. Um, these listings are free. You don't have to be an Arts Boston member. Um, and they are the basis um, really for the work that we do uh, getting that information off the website and into people's um, phones and laptops, et cetera. Um, we have a weekly email that goes out that features what's going on with online offerings. It goes to over 60,000 local households. And it's also uh, the source for our social um, on Facebook, Twitter, and, and Instagram. Um, it's also something that we use to inspire um, blog posts about what's going on. Um, we recently did one around the Huntington's um, having a lot of fun around their Instagram campaign. Uh, we did one around uh, plays that capture the meaning of Passover. And with tomorrow being International Dance Day, um, our next blog post is going to be about um, how you can get moving with uh, Greater Boston's um, dance community online. So I am going to share uh, for anyone who would like to make sure that their postings are up there, I am going to share um, a, an easy uh, tutorial on how to get your events up there and 
how to make them look really great. And I'm also going to share the name of um, Chad Sirwa, who is the uh, online uh, curator of that, uh, that calendar. And give me a second. I'm just going to put it right up here. There we go with Chad. Great. So the next thing we are we are doing is is understanding audiences. And as Cara mentioned, um, everybody wants to know how to plan, uh, and everyone's looking for information to inform uh, their operating plans, both during and and when we start coming out of uh, the COVID nineteen crisis. Uh, we looked around at uh, what might be available to help us uh, with those questions, and we are working with uh, Wolf Brown, a cultural research firm, and Alan Brown uh, on the Audience Outlook Monitor, which is a worldwide tracking study of audience attitudes about attendance at arts and cultural programs both during and um, after uh, the COVID crisis. And um, some of you, especially the, the, the theater folks, uh, will know Alan from the intrinsic impact study that he did uh, nationally. And a lot of theaters in Boston um, participated in that study. So he'll be a, a name that you're familiar with. Um, what Alan is looking to do with this is to, um, do three things um, to come up with a uh, protocol of questions for audiences that really allow for peer-based cohort learning um, based on what they find. And so starting in May, we're going to be sending this survey twice a month to our own Bostics list, those 60,000 people um, which in terms of demographics are pretty representative of the, um, of the collective Boston arts audiences. And based on that, we will get back from Alan um, results that he will analyze with a dashboard and analysis that we will be able to share with the Boston community in facilitated discussions. Um, the purpose of this is to is to help us keep a, a finger on the pulse of what the arts audiences are going through and thinking um, in the spring and summer, also into the fall, uh, so we can understand um, how they're responding to uh, decisions they're going to have to make about attending the arts. Um, it's a Boston, this will allow us to have a Boston specific study, and uh, so it will be have regional insights it will be uh, longitudinal um, starting in May and going through the end of September. And also it will allow us to customize some of the questions based on what we find. Um, we know that early on it's gonna be really baseline results, um, but as, as the summer progresses um, and we see some difference in uh, answers, we'll be able to dig down and customize those questions to be able to learn more. Um, what we'll be doing is setting up a series of, um, a series of uh, conversations online and uh, we'll be sharing that with everyone and give people plenty of time uh, to uh, participate. And we're putting together a steering committee of folks from, from our membership uh, to help make sure that uh, this is really peer driven. So uh, it's still information in terms of the protocol, et cetera. Uh, we'll have more to share uh, uh, via Arts Boston Communications on our website later this week and next week. Um, so we will absolutely keep folks informed. Um, in the same way that Cara talked about uh, the learnings from folks, uh, colleagues across the country, one of the reasons we really were 
interested in participating in this is the fact that we're doing it in conjunction with um, Chicago and San Francisco and New York. Now, New York is, is a, a city unto itself, but for Chicago and um, San Francisco, um, they have uh, similar service organizations with uh, constituents like we do, where we thought that if we came together, we'd have a lot more heft in terms of getting what we want from the arts community for specific questions and the analysis that we're looking for. So we'll be working all together to make sure that um, we are as responsive as we can from what you need. And it will be interesting to see uh, what we're seeing in other cities and what learning there can be there. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to sharing more about that going forward. And the last thing we're doing is, is asking audiences to, to take action. And this is about, um, uh, again, what Carr was talking about with um, talking about the impact that the arts have. And there is incredible, um, incredible research and data that's already been gathered um, by the Mass Cultural Council um, and other colleagues. Um, Carr, I think the, the city survey is terrific. It's going to be incredibly helpful. We also, have, we also have data and research on the positive impact and the important role that um, the arts play, uh, certainly um, in our economy. Um, the fact that we're a $2 billion um, sector, uh, we have more than 30,000 jobs, nearly as many as, as the retail sector. Um, and talking again about sports, reminding folks that more people go to the arts annually in Greater Boston than all four of our sports teams. So we have released, we released um, the Arts Boston and Arts Factor, uh, which is pretty recent um, data. It came out uh, last year. Uh, so folks can use it in their own advocacy. Um, we're also uh, working with our buddies at Mass Creative, and I will share that also with you. Don't have a link. I'm going to get it for you. Um, so those are those are the three things we are are really focusing right on right now. And um, uh, I will put my information there. Um, any questions? Any uh, other things that people need help with? Um, we're there for. So thank you again, and Don. Thank you to your team uh, for all the great communications you're doing in the conversations. Thanks. Um, really greatly appreciated. Um, friends, I cannot say enough great things about the arts factor. Um, like I said in the chat, I quote it all the time, um, and especially now. But I will get to my good friend, Peter DeMiro of the dance complex, because he's got to run and teach a class like identify. <laughs> Left hands for Brady Bunch, right hands for Hollywood Squares. Um, uh, for those of you I don't know, I, the, dan or the dance complex, uh, to remind you, is, uh, is a little bit of everything. And we, uh, in essence, um, uh, do, uh, in this uh, world right now, are providing service uh, to the Boston dance community, uh, in, a, in addition to our colleagues at Boston Dance Alliance. But we're studios, we're a professional, we're a community, we're um, two theater spaces. And um, so we have a lot of different circles of constituents. So uh, uh, one of the things we've been, uh, it's a blessing and a challenge to be able to understand what do we need to do for uh, each part of those circles at different times. So we're, uh, we're working on that. Uh, we have, of course, the dance maker community. Uh, we have the dancers themselves uh, who are professional, um, uh, uh, and then we have what I'm calling the professional community, people who engage in projects that are, um, that are uh, uh, 
you know, go on stages but aren't necessarily trained dancers. We have audiences, of course, and then students from ages three to 93. Um, I think what we're noticing right now, just to update where we are right now after this kind of a, initial uh, concern, uh, a lot of our work is, is going online and a lot of dancers are trying to find a creative outlet. Um, Dawn was on a, a call of, of ours the other day. Um, we've put together, a, uh, before this all happened, we put together a circle of advisors kind of representing different genres in dance and, um, and the theater world a bit and also just trying to uh, get the best of advice for best and better practices. So that had been, been put in place is gonna help us, I think, kind of weather the storm and try to hear our ear to the ground on what's best for the hip hop community, what's best for uh, the ballet community, different different sectors uh, that I know that, uh, that Deborah and Boston Dance Alliance uh, deal with as well. Um, we too talk a lot about coming back and what does it look like? And uh, Kara, you just really helped me think a lot about uh, the most extreme uh, situation where people let's say in a contact improv class can't contact you know what the hell is going to go <laughs> on you know in that situation so uh you know, we're thinking of the actual content of classes building up a steam of uh more online classes and and interrupting the pattern especially of our longer established teachers who are afraid of the internet and who are afraid of teaching in this very non what feels like a non-personal way there have been great strides over the last few weeks with with that happening so we see that just continuing and we see a new normal that will be uh, both um, online classes or, or uh, live classes uh, to a certain point. And when we get to the pre-registration of, of the cutoff of 10 to 12 people, whatever it is, or 15, whatever uh, we find out, then you can register for uh, an online space. And, uh, and we, we have, we're in the process of also um, uh, pushing up our work study program to be more of a community um, a community ambassador program and this was timely too because um, we had just received a little bit of money to uh, think of our work studies not as uh, people sitting at a front desk only uh, and pointing to uh, a studio but to actually act as docents uh, of a person's dance experience to act as a guidance counselor uh, per se so these issues of mental health, which we see a lot of happening in, the, uh, in our world right now, uh, we, just, uh, we just feel like we're gonna need to attend to the full person all the way through this. And we're very excited actually to be able to, we're sorry for the situation, but very excited to be able to take this next step, taken seriously by our funders. Not that they didn't take it seriously before, but now it's kind of like, oh, we see your point. <laughs> you need to embrace the, the wholeness of what's going on. Um, uh, we, uh, as an example of online classes, um, Don and I chatted as well, the, uh, we see a lot of people reaching online to take class at whatever level. They're reaching out to national mentors and international mentors to go back and take class to. This works in uh, both um, us going out to the outer world. Uh, uh, I, see, I see myself actually reaching out for, we're doing a, um, some of our online media programming, fireside chats, so I've been having chats with uh, with Liz Lerman and different people around the country as well as local folks. So there's actually a silver lining in this is connecting Boston to this outer community. Um, and on the flip of that is Marcus Schulkind, who's been a 50 year veteran of teaching, has a lot of uh, former students, had 90 people online from four different countries uh, and uh, like of all ages. And this would not have happened uh, without uh, having to be, go through this, this moment. Um, so, Again, uh, it's not to say we want to go through this every day, but we are learning that we can be more than we, uh, than we uh, have been. Um, I feel like uh, as far as physical space goes, what we're looking at, as, as Kara suggests, is, is uh, uh, how do we have the flow of this building uh, uh, um, be adaptable? We have two staircases, one of which we don't use, so it'll be an up staircase and a down staircase. There will be, um, there will be a registration for um, for space in the building as well as in the classrooms. There'll be a look at how we deal with changing rooms and bathrooms and, uh, and common areas, uh, which I know is gonna take an investment of money and time. Uh, the technological equipment to be able to live stream classes, you know, three or four at a time uh, and have people to man that. 
is not something we've ever dealt with. So we're, we're thinking in that realm. And in the rehearsal, the dance maker world, I'm imagining that we are in a place where we, uh, for people to be able to be that close, do we do what nail salons and, and hairdressers are, are doing by taking temperatures uh, uh, or not? So I uh, was a lot of unknown, but we're trying to think uh, the widest thing possible and then narrow in. Um, and I think we're, uh, we're really hoping that we can uh, be adaptable and uh, and plan it out right, uh, but what's right every every third week there's a new thing. So, and I, I just wanted to mention um, briefly about just the art that's being made or what artists are doing in the dance world. Um, uh, Alex Davis and Joy Davis, some of you might know as the Davis sisters, have uh, created an archive of, of lost art, what they're calling lost art. So uh, artists can, uh, dance makers can uh, list or anybody can list uh, things that didn't get performed yet. Um, my own company, Stone, uh, uh, Public Displays of Motion, we're taking an, uh, a creative city project uh, the, uh, about intergenerational dialogue among uh, LGBTQ plus folks and putting that online. Um, uh, so there are, are ways that we're trying to continue to work that I think we're maybe n more nimble than theater in some ways. Um, and we'll be able to come back sooner because the, um, uh, because of improvisational structures and site specific work and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, I do imagine our own season uh, starting with uh, uh, online festivals, uh, online outdoor festivals. I have one 60 year old woman who, um, uh, who doesn't want to come back to the building, but she'll go to a park to take her African class because she can be six feet away from somebody else. And it's a big concern. It's, I think it's both um, a practical health concern, but it's also her mental health. Um, and I think we're gonna uh, be holding, <laughs> holding hands figuratively, not literally, because we can't. Um, so I, I think that might be an intro to, uh, to other things Deborah might bring up later too. Um, Peter, let me know if I'm speaking out of turn, but you have also talked a little bit about uh, trying to find ways to make the dance complex available to folks after we're able. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, we, you know, we've often uh, in, in our history, uh, there have been a time when we tried to um, separate from everything. It all had to be all dance all the time. And, uh, and I applaud uh, my predecessors uh, wanting to make dance special, but um, we have actually over the last few years uh, trying to be more open to uh, other artists and other uh, uh, fusions of work. So, um, so we're looking at what will spaces, can our spaces hold theater rehearsals, can our spaces hold dance, uh, music, sorry. And uh, we're happy to explore that. I think especially um, considering that uh, we, we may not be able to congregate in class formation in the same way. We have these beautiful spaces that should be used and uh, we're just willing to work, you know, one-on-one -on -one with folks to figure out what's, what's best, um, so. Thank you. Um, T, were there any questions in the chat? There are not any questions in the chat, but right. uh, Catherine Peterson did link towards uh, some news with ART and the Harvard School of Public Health that's going on. Yeah, I saw that come out yesterday. Super exciting news over there, right? Between ART and Rhode Island announcing, like well. things are moving and that feels good. Um, well, great. If there are no further questions for Peter, I would like to move over to, and everybody's my good, good friend, uh, Luke Blackadder of Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. Luke, where are you? There you are. I'm here. Hey. So good morning, everyone. Um, as Don said, I'm Luke Blackadder, the director of the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts of Massachusetts. And um, really just going to give a couple brief updates on some of the major legal legislative hallmarks that have happened in the past week and what some of the programming that Arts and Business Council and Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts have been offering um, to our constituents and, and you guys and the arts community generally. So first of all, there have been really three big um, legal legislative updates within the last week. As everyone knows, last Monday, the Mass Department of Unemployment Assistance dropped the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance application. And as many of you, I'm sure, also know that your mileage may vary with that application and there have been some challenges and hiccups with the rollout, to put it mildly and politely and diplomatically, because this is recorded. Um, 
So for those who don't know the pandemic unemployment assistance application, that is a system that is the federal program that expands unemployment benefits to traditionally ineligible populations, among others, independent contractors, self-employed workers, et cetera. Um, so currently, you know, how do we determine whether we should apply for regular UI versus PUA? The general threshold right now is if you have at least $5,100 in 2019 um, in W-2 tax withheld income from an employer, then you should be applying for traditional unemployment insurance benefits. Um, but there are a number of other criteria and actually the Department of Unemployment Assistance has a really excellent series of documents. They have like a really user-friendly eight-page guide just introducing the program. They have a flow chart. They have a list of rec uh, required documents and they have a list of eligibility criteria. I think it's just mass.gov forward slash department dash unemployment dash assistance dot um, forward slash. But they have really excellent resources and I really defer to them and they, um, they're really user-friendly and they do walk you through the program. I would say just bear in mind, my understanding right now regarding unemployment is that there are currently regular UI and pandemic unemployment assistance are staffed by two separate groups of DUA employees. So the left hand kind of doesn't know what the right hand's doing. So if you have questions about regular UI, make sure you go to the right um, resource. And if you have questions about PUA, make sure you go to the right resource because the systems are different and PUA is very new and we're kind of building the plane as we're falling right now. So uh, do bear in mind that I think we're still gonna be ironing out kinks for the next couple of weeks, but that's, that's big update number one um, that hopefully those of you who have needed it have already been able to avail yourselves of it. The second one is on the same day, last Monday, um, Governor Baker signed into law the eviction and foreclosure moratorium law. So now that is law and that requires that Landlords, creditors and mortgage holders, and courts cannot enforce eviction actions, um, non-emergency eviction actions during the pendency of this COVID-19 pandemic. So what is a non-emergency eviction? It's really an eviction that doesn't have to relate, that doesn't need to be carried out in order to protect public health and, or the health and safety of others in the space. So. For, uh, eviction for non-rent payments or foreclosure for late mortgage payments, those are going to be put on hold for the pendency of this um, pandemic and for the state of emergency. And um, so that means that, again, landlords can't um, pursue eviction actions. They can't go to court and initiate some reprocess. Um, foreclosure, um, Creditors can't initiate foreclosure or sales or um, things like that. And courts also cannot currently uh, take action and rule on these and enforce them. So really important to know that their limits are not only on the creditors and the property owners, but also on the trial courts right now. Um, and I believe the uh, Supreme Judicial Court also issued uh, a continuation of the closure of the courts for non-emergency cases. So I think that's now, I think those are, are the closures has been extended from I think May 4th now to early June. So generally the courts are only handling, um, if it's not emergency and they can do it remotely, they might do hearings and stuff remotely, but generally the courts are only open for emergency hearings right now anyway. Um, so that's an important thing to know. And again, the deadline for the it will the foreclosure moratorium will end, I believe, between either 45 days after the end of the state of emergency or you know 120 days from when the statute was passed. So I think we're looking at August 8th would be the earliest. So no activity on that front for a while except for emergencies. And then the third big one is um, Last Thursday, I believe, the United States Congress um, replenished uh, a number of these um, federal loan programs. So 
$310 billion to replenish the SBA um, Paycheck Protection Program, and then $10 billion to replenish the um, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. And I believe banks have started processing the PPP loans yesterday, and I know that it's also been a challenge and that a lot of, um, there's a lot of questions about, has my application been processed? Because I think the idea was that the SBA was trying to anticipate the surge and that they were going to process applications in batches, but they're still having problems and they're still site crashes and slowdowns. So um, get, you know, if you haven't applied yet, apply as soon as possible. If you're eligible for that, for the Paycheck Protection Program loans, um, but do bear in mind that it's still, you know, there's still a lot of bottlenecking. Um, and that I, there, I plug for Emily Ruddock and Mass Creative for keeping finger on the pulse for um, all of these legislative updates. So if there's going to be another round of funding for it, we'll find out. Um, I can't imagine that this pot of money won't dry up within two weeks like the last one did. I would be really surprised if suddenly everyone was really cool and patient about it. I don't think that's the way it's going to happen. Um, but, you know, I defer to Mass Creative and Emily and Tracy and, and team for, um, you know, any updates on what's the next pot of funding it'll look like. So those are kind of the three big legal legislative updates. Um, and also, plug for Mass Creative's Friday morning uh, legislative updates. If you're all zoomed out at the end of the week, they are mercifully short. So they're only 15 minutes and they keep it to a tight 15 minutes. So that alone, that is reason alone. Um, and just Emily Tracy and um, Sophia do an outstanding job of kind of, again, keeping their finger on the pulse for all of this. Um, so VLA programming and, and things that we have been doing at Arts and Business Council is we're still providing one-to-one -one technical assistance for people who need assistance with applying for unemployment assistance, PUA, um, Paycheck Protection Program loans, um, EIDL loans. We are still doing that. Alexis and her intern Julia are still firing on all pistons and um, they are still taking your calls and helping you as much as they can. So that program is still available. So if you or your constituents have any questions or issues and need help with just what is my eligibility, what's right for me, um, we're still taking those calls. I think that we might be, depending on need, we're trying to be flexible with our capacity and expand as necessary. Um, I know we're, we're pretty booked, I think, this week, but if the demand is such that we need it, then I know Alexis will take on a couple extra days to, to accommodate. So that's the little resource that's available. Um, we just filmed, I think last week I just recorded another interview, a follow-up interview with the two employment and labor attorneys, Elizabeth Mason and Jill Havens, to talk about the pandemic unemployment assistance program now that that has dropped, and really just dealing with frequently asked questions we've been receiving. So things like iron W-2 and 1099 income, what do I do? I earn income from out of state, what do I do? Um, quite, you know, a, a lot of the frequently asked questions we've been receiving, what type of information do I need to furnish? I have a really, you know, my W-2 income is so tiny, do I need to report it, things like that. So I strongly recommend checking that video out. Um, again, it just covers some of the common questions that we've been getting for the last couple of weeks. Um, and, we're still updating our articles um, as new resources and new information from the US state and local government organizations have been coming out. So we just updated the housing and foreclosure moratorium uh, document now that that's dropped. Um, Alexis and Julia are constantly updating the PPP and the loans and the CARES Act documents. So all of that stuff is um, available. Oh, question, where could that be found? Um, so that all of these resources are on our our website at artsandbusinesscouncil.org forward slash COVID-19 and I'll drop it in the chat um, but all of our resources are there we're updating it pretty regularly I would say at least weekly but it's really as information we do it on a rolling basis as information becomes available um, also two weeks ago I recorded a video with immigration attorney Bennett Savitz about 
what if you have constituents, a lot of our, our artists community members are here on temporary visitor visas, they might be students, they might be working, um, how do they avail themselves of these federal programs, federal, state, and local programs. So we did do an interview with him also to discuss that. Um, so if you have people who are dealing with those issues as well, um, that's another resource available. And also our flagship lawyer referral program, we are still waiving all service fees for any artists who've been dealing with um, suffering from COVID-19, either financially or physically. So all of those fees are waived. We don't want money to be an immediate barrier to your ability to get legal assistance right now. Um, we still need to, to make sure you qualify for pro bono. So we do still need um, financial proof of income so we can qualify you for pro bono, but at least for the service of matching you with attorney, those fees are still waived. So again, don't let that cost be a barrier to getting legal help. And we still have our team of about, now I'd say we're at eight or nine large national law firms that are willing to process um, and help provide really rapid response to certain COVID-19 related legal issues, namely contracts, disputes, employment issues, insurance issues. So that's still available as well. Um, and I think that is, that's what I got. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ask the obvious question. Nobody make fun of me. This is totally recorded, so everybody can see it. Once I have applied for PPP or EIDL, I cannot apply again. Is that correct? Yeah, that's my understanding. Is that once you've applied, that's right. Great. So. Um, uh, can right. I, I hate to say the answer. But... Yeah. Hi, Eva. Hey, Eva. Hi. Hey. <laughs> hey, friend. Uh, introduce yourself. Tell yourself. Tell all the world who you are. Oh, sure. I'm Eva Rosenberg. I'm Interim Director of Arts and Culture at the Boston Foundation. I'm sorry to be joining late. Um, I've been learning a lot about PPP lately as the foundation is doing a lot to try to support the sector and small businesses, especially those owned by people of color, um, in getting to the front of the queue on PPP. You can only apply once to the SBA, but if your bank has not yet put your application forward to the SBA, then you can apply with other banks. You just need to be ready to pull the other applications once they submit. And the way you can know if they've submitted to the SBA is if you have a loan application number. That's how um, they can prove to you that they have submitted your materials to the SBA. But just know that because it's a multi-step process, just because you've applied to the bank doesn't mean um, the SBA has received your application. Great, thank you. Um, I, th I think a lot of us are finding that out as we go. <laughs> Um, friends, if there are no questions for Luke, I would like to move on to Deborah Cash at the Boston Dance Alliance. Uh okay, so um, first of all, thank you. Um, Um, one of the things that Boston Dance Alliance has always been about is about aggregating information and also connecting people to the resources they need, whether they're things that we generate or things that we leverage from our partners. And that has never been more true than it has been in the last eight weeks. Um, so that as um, you know, Emily at Mass Creative or the Arts and Business Council or colleagues in other places have come up with information. We have been sending it out at the rapid, most rapid pace that we can. Um, one of the things that has been clear um, in a lot of situations is that if you already had a structure in place to do something and could pivot its use, that was faster <clears throat> than some other things. Let me just drink a little bit. <clears throat> so that, um, for instance, when the city had the Opportunity Fund and it could simply repurpose that money, um, it was able to turn on a dime. Um, we were able to do that with our weekly newsletter, which is no longer weekly. It's about every two, three days. <clears throat> but that as um, I, 
identify resources that are going to be useful to people. I send those out. Our list is about 3,000 people. Um, and then it also gets posted on our website and on Facebook. And there's a listserv <clears throat> that's kind of a, um, from an old uh, kind of pre-Facebook world <clears throat> that some people still rely on that's a push rather than a pull. Um, so that all of that information is going on. And the one thing that I can encourage everyone <clears throat> that I've really learned is tone is everything that people um, in our constituency are completely overwhelmed. <clears throat> they're overwhelmed because their livelihoods are at stake. They're overwhelmed in the case of dancers, working dancers, because their instruments are in danger. Um, that they, if they want to come back to the field when this is over, they have to stay in shape in ways that they've never had to do before without you know, going to class and without, you know, going to gyrotonics or getting massages or, you know, any of the things that they've relied on and had to reinvent that. Um, and that there also is a situation where um, their need to manage their livelihood um, in, an, uh, in a profession where they've had different kinds of work, whether it's a day job and a artistic practice or dance teaching and dance performing, all of them disappeared at once. So that while they're very familiar with the juggling job, um, as most creatives are, <clears throat> they also have a situation where there's been crisis on every, every single category, um, even if <clears throat> good, will, you know, good luck they're not ill, um, and many of them, because this is a community primarily of young workers, um, a lot of them have children. So um, ch young children or housemates or other um, constraints on their, uh, on their ability to be stable. Other information from the Arts and Business Council, from um, information I've been getting from my art service organization colleagues in other cities um, through Dance USA, <clears throat> and bringing that information to bear on um, the local community. Um, and <clears throat> one of the things that's been really interesting about that for me is unlike um, someone like, like Peter or, or the dancers at Urbanity who have an existing studio and existing constituency, um, Boston Dance Alliance has always been a virtual organization. Uh, we don't have a space. We have 135 square feet in the basement of Boston Ballet, which has been an office for one, two, or three people at different times. Um, and that our work has been done either on the ground um, by going to things um, and showing the flag um, at performances or classes, um, or being conveyed through digital and sometimes hard copy information with only a couple of times of gathering a year. Um, that has been very useful because the constraints around, well, you're in Cambridge, Somerville, and you're in Boston, or you're on the North Shore, you're in on the South Shore, um, you're on the Cape and Islands. Um, that has all gone away. <laughs> Suddenly, we are not only all in the same boat, but we're in the same catchment area. We're all dealing with the same um, universal um, global crisis. Um, many of the same constraints on our ability to practice. And it means that we can understand ourselves as a sector in a different way. Um, and I think that there will be long-term silver lining to that. Um, um, so I'm, I'm really quite interested um, in beginning to think about that. <clears throat> the other thing that Boston Dance Alliance has been able to do a little bit differently than um, our studio-based colleagues has been <clears throat> that we've been able to do some help um, with the adjacent professionals. <clears throat> so I spent some time talking to Steve Edelman at Teddy Shoes 
um, which is, you know, a anchor organization for the dance community as a dancewear provider um, who was, had a crisis associated with understanding small business offerings available to him. Um, I've talked to a couple of um, dance pianists who are accompanists who were not um, eligible for our um, thing, but whose real understanding of their network was within the dance community. And I was able to then send them to other resources, whether it was the Music Makers Fund or MCC or, or some other places. But to also understand how all of those are independent as well, inter interdependent as well has been um, both eye-opening and um, I think will make us stronger um, in the long run to understand those networks in a deeper way. Um, um, the big thing um, we've done in the last um, couple of weeks um, on April 1st, um, and some of you know this, we opened a dance relief fund <clears throat> with um, some support, seed support from the Boston Foundation. Thank you, Eva. And um, the Elliott Fund um, uh, and a number of individuals. Um, at this point, we've raised over $10,000. Um, and have um, been able to um, give stipend to about 42 people. Um, and importantly, um, we were able to turn to um, Matt MacArthur, but also um, uh, dance relief funds in New York and in LA and in San Francisco to think about how to do it in a way that was both um, efficient and equitable. Um, I was very concerned about equity issues. <clears throat> we wanted to do it first come, first served. Um, it was only $250 a stipend, um, which was kind of the grocery money stipend as opposed to something that was really going to get people back on their feet. Um, but I also knew that there were dancers in the community, especially the choreographers who are used to applying for grants, who had a lot of understanding of how to get in on these opportunities, whereas um, uh, people who were affiliated with independent uh, dance teachers um, might not be, because there has not been funding for them or for indiv individual dancers in any of the programs that have existed in the last couple of years. So um, we basically put the word out. Um, you know, I let the studio community know that, you know, if you were a studio owner, you needed to apply under small business. But if you were an independent teacher, um, you were eligible for this stipend. Um, I put out the word to the BAMS Fest and to Racines, which are the festivals of black dance in our community. Um, to say, you know, please let your networks know that this is going to be launched in a couple of days so that when we pull the trigger and are ready to accept applications, your folks can get in line. And that turned out to have been very wise because we had 50 applications in the first 36 hours and we're on, we are now on day two of the applicants. We had <clears throat> ultimately, um, in the two weeks we were open, we had 75 applications. We have now been able to support about 50% of them. Um, that turns out to be a fantastic, um, if somewhat frustrating for me, because I know these people and I want to give them all money. Um, it's a really good um, ratio, um, Dance NYC, which had over a thousand applicants, um, had, um, has only been able to support about a quarter of its applicants. Um, and that's just, you know, every, every, everybody who's giving out money has a big queue left that they can't touch. And that has been reassuring to me that I don't feel a personal failure that I can't, come up with enough money to support everyone I want to, if I understand it systemically. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that, which I know is something that Cara and um, um, the, the city have been thinking about and, and somewhat the state, is that <clears throat> while I originally was feeling very 
frustrated and sad that the need was so great and we were only going to be able to serve a small percentage with a small amount of money, we are also generating data. We are being able to demonstrate the depth of the need. And I don't like that that's the way we're finding out. Um, I would much rather have just surveyed people instead of gotten their hopes up that money was coming. Um, but I do think that um, people are very, very grateful. Um, I've gotten some astonishing emails um, of, of gratitude. Um, and I do think that when we have the ability to support our constituency in this moment, the feeling that they're not forgotten, the feeling that people are trying, even if it's not as adequate to the need, um, makes them feel better and makes them feel more in a position to advocate for themselves. Um, dancers especially, I think, often are the last on the list. Um, their work can't be quantified. People don't make money off their work the way painters might. Um, and often feel like nobody takes them seriously. Um, so I think the, the morale boost has been worth a lot. Excellent. Uh, Deborah, thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm going to move on to our last speaker of the afternoon, Margaret Felice of uh, the Boston Singers Resource, which Stage Force uh, used to have a long history with. Margaret, um, please introduce yourself to the group. Yeah. Um, so my name is Margaret. I have been the executive director of Boston Singers Resource for about five years. Like many people, I wear a million hats as teacher, actor, singer, writer, and I see a lot of familiar faces and familiar names on this call, which reminds me that, and I'm so tired of this phrase, but in this case, I think it's appropriate that we are all in this together. We really have a lot of things binding us together. I'm gonna to be quick because I know lots of folks have other meetings, including myself. So um, a couple of things that Boston Singers Resource has done in the last six weeks ha that have been keeping us very busy and we're a very small shop. Oh, I should say, probably the easiest way to summarize what BSR is, I, usually if I'm talking to people from the theater community, I say we're like stage source, but for classical singers. Um, connecting singers with gigs through an email of postings, connecting audiences with concerts through a vocal music calendar, providing continuing education, career development. We have an open company audition, um, run workshops and things like that. So that's who we are. We have also since 2009 had a program called the Boston Singers Relief Fund. Um, and that has provided grants to classical singers who have had some sort of hardship, usually an illness or some sort of accident that prevented them from singing. Um, I think March 10th was the day that Handel and Haydn canceled and then BLO's Norma came quickly after that and Boston Baroque came quickly after that and on the 10th we started having conversations about how can we pivot the fund towards emergency relief for COVID-19 related cancellations. So we launched a streamlined application on the 11th or the 12th for classical singers, grants of up to $500 um, to make up for lost income due to COVID-19 related cancellations. We had, we left that application open for about two and a half weeks. Um, we gave 22 grants, just over $10,000, and we've had a lot of interest since we took a look at the application and the process to make sure that it was what we wanted it to be and could help the most possible singers and we're reopening applications this week um, in the next couple of days. So if you know of any singers who have lost work, because of this. Uh, it is limited to classical singers, but we um, were pretty intentional about making sure that we covered people's church gigs. We find that a lot of singers make a significant amount of money from their engagements at churches weekend after weekend, and that's starting to build up. So especially those of you who know crossover singers, please send them our way for that. We've had a couple of online chats. Um, we had a career chat with Renee Tatum, who's a prominent mezzo-soprano. We had an opera chat with some opera leaders, including Will, who was just on the call and had to duck off. We've been providing content on our blog, things like how to transition to 
um, teaching voice lessons virtually because a lot of singers are also teaching lessons and we've switched our vocal music calendar to being vocal music news where we share live streams and video content and um, other information that would be interesting to your standard vocal music um, audiences and we've always included musicals in that calendar so if any of you have live streams or content that you want to share with us i'll pop my email into the chat in a moment um thinking about moving forward you know there's a lot <laughs> i've been lucky to have a couple live streamed gigs over the last couple weeks and i've become very aware of my globules as i sing singing spreads a lot of stuff so it's going to be hard to get also be a change in I don't want to say a change in standards because I think that puts a value judgment on it um, we're gonna see a change in attitude towards the types of groups that can throw a digital piano in the back of a car and perform outside rather than having to be in front of a grand piano in a grand concert hall I think um, those activities are gonna On our opera chast week, we heard from a couple opera we for at a level where it's safe to be singing outside. Um, so there is a lot of innovation there. We haven't had a choral chat yet. There have been some meetings with the Greater Boston Choral Consortium. There's also Choral Arts New England. And I think groups are thinking about what are they going to do. And there really aren't good answers yet. I know they're asking a lot of the same questions as theater companies and trying to figure things out. I think operating with reduced audience capacity is gonna be a necessity and that's gonna create a lot of financial um, considerations that everybody's gonna have to think about. Um, so that is sort of my elevator speech about the very busy last six weeks. Um, it's been great to talk to you all. Happy to answer questions, but hopefully I covered a lot of it. Um, Margaret, that was great. And I just sort of want to reinforce this thing that you were saying, not so much about standards, but like who is going to take an electronic keyboard, throw it in the back of their car and go out and create art that I think there are so many of us that are like, we have to have this level of perfection right now, right now. Um, and how does that, right? Like it's that thing that Julie Henrich just used to say to me all the time, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. How can we start to put art back into the world that is thoughtful, that is safe, Right, but that we can work on it while we do it. Um, like Luke said, building the airplane while we're falling. I think there is some of that um, ability to pivot that is intrinsic to the performing arts community. And I hope that we all start to like figure those things out in a safe way, right? Like I'm not advocating for, um, and everybody is standing in a circle holding hands. Like, no, please never again um, wear a mask when we do whatever. But I, I do wanna sort of reinforce that idea. I think we'll have the same, a lot, a lot of the same considerations around digital content. Mm -hmm. um, virtual choirs are nice, but they're sort of a novelty and they're not a musical skill. Um, they're a production skill. They're an engineering skill. Yeah. Um, you know, people are sharing content right now online that's great, mm -hmm. but it's not perfect because yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of equity issues. That, this is another, <laughs> another one of my high horses, so I'll keep yeah. it to there's a lot of equity issues with producing online content right. because if you don't have specific equipment or someone who can edit it all for you in post, it's going to look a little different. So I think there's a really nice understanding about the realness of art that's coming from this that is on my list of silver linings. The other yeah. silver lining I found is that there were a lot of and our institution committed to making sure that happens again so that it's not the individual artist who's at the bottom of the totem pole when things when there are budgetary concerns i love it Those Thanks. Things. wonderful um all right friends so just looking at the chat i'm not seeing any questions right now but 
almost everybody here has put their email in the chat. You know where we are if you want to get a hold of anybody. Everybody here has a website, right? I hate to say Google it, but uh, we're all grown human beings. Um, so I'm going to let everybody off the hook. We can say goodbye for now. We will be back same time next Tuesday um, with uh, Mass Creative and some of our friends from the other art service organizations in a couple of other cities on the Northeast talking about what reopening might look like. What are the concerns? What are people thinking about? Um, and we'll send out, I think, a tiny little survey in the next couple of weeks just trying to measure how helpful these conversations are, what are the other things that we need to be talking about and covering um, over the coming weeks. And that's it. Uh, thank you all for participating. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.